I think Christianity is committed to four key convictions that function as the parameters that inform our understanding of pluralism, our commitment to the common good, and our practice of toleration. These are four, if, if uh, in another sense, I might call these four sort of biblical uh, themes or motifs that shape now how, as a Christian, I think about these. The first is this. There is an affirmation of pluralism of a certain sort that is built into the very biblical narrative itself. So the creator has given us a world in which a thousand flowers bloom and God takes delight in their difference. He takes delight in a wide array of cultural diversity. Indeed, it's interesting in the biblical narrative uh, that we share with other Abrahamic traditions as well, uh, one of the reasons why God responds to the vaunted efforts of the Tower of Babel, in fact, is not just because of hubris, but actually because the Tower of Babel represents a homogenizing effort to colonize everyone under, it says, one tongue. So, in fact, the God who scatters at Babel is in, on the side of diversity, in a sense, and that's woven into the biblical narrative itself. Secondly, the biblical vision of flourishing is one of creation-wide shalom, is the Hebrew word that the prophet Jeremiah and other prophets would describe. It's a vision of creation-wide shalom. This, this is a vision of peaceful order in which people and the planet realize their fullness and potential. And it's a vision not only of right order, but I would also emphasize it's a vision of abundance. It's a hope for a renewed creation in which there is no more hunger, no more pain, no more lack. Indeed, the very good news that Jesus announces in his first sermon, as it were, in Luke chapter 4, was from the very beginning, for example, good news for the poor. So it's uh, what I'm trying to emphasize is that in, in a Christian understanding of these things, uh, um, Christianity uh, uh, is concerned not only with souls, but also with bellies, you might say. It's, it is, I, I want to emphasize, this biblical vision, this Christian understanding is a fundamentally holistic vision. In this sense, I want to suggest that Christianity is a humanism of a certain sort. That is, we believe that creatures flourish when people and institutions and systems run with the grain of the universe, in a sense. Third, it's important to note that Christian faith is inherently eschatological. Now, I, so this is, I have to apologize, this is the one insider baseball term that I want to kind of use uh, this evening, so let me explain. Um, Christian faith is inherently eschatological. What does that mean? Integral to the biblical narrative is an account of what we call last things. The Greek word here is eschaton. So an eschatology is like your vision of the end, your vision of last things. And Christianity is fundamentally a religion of hope that longs for this vision of shalom, this creation-wide flourishing, to be realized. That's what I mean when I say that Christianity is inherently an eschatological religion. Not as some end times escape from this world, but actually as a this-worldly realization of the shalom that God wants. So this is why, uh, again, uh, popular uh, sort of renditions of this don't do us any favors. But if you actually read the Bible and get to the end, in Revelation 21 and 22, uh, the scriptures envision, in fact, a new earth, not a heavenly hijacking, okay? And even more importantly, and this is actually a lot, a lot that I want to think through with you tonight uh, hinges on this point. Because Christianity is an eschatological religion of hope for this fullness in the future, it's also important to emphasize that we don't believe that this is something we can realize through our own efforts, right? That is, uh, uh, and, and admittedly, I will be the first to admit that I think 
uh, Christians at different times and in different places have got this wrong, have forgotten uh, this part of the biblical narrative. So, so we work in hope of that kind of vision of flourishing and fullness for the whole of creation. We work in hope towards that, but there is also built into Christianity a fundamental sense of waiting for that kingdom to come. That leads me to this fourth conviction, this fourth parameter, if you will. It's precisely because this eschatology is integral to Christian faith that Christians have a nuanced account of the meantime in which we find ourselves, right? That is, what, what we're, the question and the conversation we're having right now finds us in this meantime between praying for thy kingdom come and waiting for its arrival. And the best thinking in the Christian tradition has always had a nuanced account of what it means to inhabit this time. St. Augustine, or some will say St. Augustine, a North African 5th century thinker, who in some ways you might describe as one of our earliest political philosophers in the Christian tradition, one of the earliest theorists of civil society in the Christian tradition, he described this meantime in which we find ourselves as the seculum, the seculum from which we get the word secular. But it's a time, it's the seculum is the contested time from the fall of humanity to the return of Christ in which we as humans still bear responsibility for the organization of human society but come to that shared collaborative work with different fundamental convictions. This understanding of the seculum means that Christians actually expect disagreements and don't expect the realization of kingdom come based on our efforts or policies or political machinations. We keep praying thy kingdom come. This is what Christians regularly pray, what we sometimes call the Lord's Prayer, in which one of the, the lines that we repeat is thy kingdom come. And we keep praying that precisely because we know it's not here yet. So in light of those sort of four motifs and convictions, how do those parameters shape a Christian understanding of pluralism, toleration, and pursuit of the common good? I'll, I'll try to summarize this briefly in just two themes. First of all, Christians in public life want to bear witness to what I'm calling the grain of the universe. That is, we want to invite our neighbors to find wholeness and fullness in the norms and order that we believe are invitations to flourishing. We believe that there is a kind of normative set of goods that are inscribed into the very structure of creation and that creation and creatures flourish when they move in that direction. So we believe that there is a normative telos, a normative end or goal of human nature that is not of our own choosing. We don't get to just make this up. And that we actually find liberation and fullness when we live in the grooves of that grain, so to speak. So precisely because we love our neighbors, we will testify to these norms. We'll invite others to uh, uh, find their flourishing in those parameters and, and even hope for policies that perhaps nudge people in that direction, to use Cass Sunstein's language. Secondly and finally, because we are in the seculum, however, we expect disagreement. We realize that not everyone affirms the same goods or telos. Indeed, we live in an age where we think, uh, where, where people think that they can determine their own telos, and we have a fundamental disagreement with that, obviously. But a Christian response is not to impose homogeneity, that was the Tower of Babel strategy, but rather to show how and why going against the grain of the universe only frustrates flourishing. Our, so in that sense, I would say our toleration is admittedly temporal. That is, it stems not from some relativist indifference, but rather from a disciplined conviction that we are, as Paul writes, to wait for the sun. 